Warren. She's here today. She's the industry leader and she's the head of the research team that worked with me for the last year to do this analysis. And what we're going to talk to you about today is truly a brand new analysis. Nobody, no company, no organization has never done this level of research into these new technologies. And I'm going to share with you some really exciting conclusions. I hope you're excited. I am. I've also had a lot of coffee today, so please forgive me. Now, it's not possible to talk about manufacturing without talking about Henry Ford. And if there was one thing that Henry Ford believed in, it was not customer service. Henry Ford is probably most famous for saying, you can have any color of car you want as long as it's black. But he was onto something. And it wasn't about customer service, it was about standardization. The Model T was the first car to use interchangeable parts. It was the first car to be produced on a moving assembly line. Uh, and it was the first car that went from being a product that was produced in hundreds or thousands to being something that was produced in the millions. In 1908, Henry Ford moved the Model T from a fixed to a moving production line. And by 1914, what had taken 14 hours at the beginning was now down to just 90 minutes to produce a whole Model T. And as you can see, they were growing up manufacturing at incredible rates. Now, standardization was just one of what we see as three fundamental principles that guide product design and manufacturing. The first was standardization. But on top of standardization came modularization. So as companies learned about how to standardize products, they also started to think about how to modularize them. And modularization gave them an increased level of flexibility. So standardization gave you scale and low cost for a part. But it turns out that when you put a part uh, into, a into a module, a subassembly, it costs even less to assemble the final product. And of course, at the logical conclusion of this whole process, we have products like the Boeing 787, which may have millions of parts, but are actually snapped together from what are amount to less than a dozen modules. Now, standardization and modularization were the foundation. And then more recently, we entered into the era of digitization. Now, at IBM, we love to talk about digitization. We love to talk about the smarter planet. But the truth in manufacturing is that Digitization is mostly used for simplification. So we take mechanically complex systems and we make them simple using electronics. So if we think about the temperature sensor in your oven, the timer in your toaster, the fly-by-wire system on an airplane, right? all of these things took what were mechanically complex and made them electronically simple. And that drove down costs and it simplified the supply chain management proposition. But when you add all of these up together, what we ended up with was a very complex global supply chain. So standardization gave us economies of scale, right? Three foundational items. We got economies of scale from standard parts. We learned from assembly that we should have sub-assembly partners that serve multiple companies. That gave us complexity, because now you were getting parts from one organization. You were sending them over to an assembler for modularization. And then, if you were doing manufacturing, you were going to search for global, low-cost locations. And so what we ended up with were big, complex, and global supply chains. Right? And we've had a century of that. Now, every single one of you has, I'm sure, in your pocket, a phone. And the odds are, at the back of that phone, there are six little words designed in California, assembled in China. Right? This is the ultimate conclusion of a century of supply chain management. A sophisticated product is created in California. The design goes all the way to China, where parts from all over the world converge. It's put together in the volumes of millions and then shipped out all over the world. It would have blown Henry Ford's mind. And most importantly, not only is this a feat of engineering and supply chain management, you could get it in two colors, black and white. Is that progress? Now, these three rules of supply chain management that we've learned about, standardization, modularization, digitization, we're basically now going to throw them away because they are under transformation from three new technological revolutions. And that's really what I'm here to talk to you about today. 
Uh, these three technological revolutions are driven by uh, emerging technologies including 3D printing, advanced robotics, and open source electronics. And I want to go into each one of these individually. So first, let me talk to you about 3D printing, because this is easily the most important of the technological revolutions that we're looking at. 3D printing is amazing because it's just like 2D printing. You design something online, and you press print. And just like two-dimensional printing, you can put out a thousand pages that all have the same words on them, or you can put out a thousand pages that all have different words on them. It doesn't matter. There's no economies of scale. But in this case, that's a good thing. So everything we learned about how to have standardized parts, we can forget it, because we can make a thousand individual parts that are different or a thousand the same. It costs the same. Right? And that works everything from shoes to hearing aids to aerospace parts. Now already, 3D printing is inexpensive enough that consumers can buy their own 3D printers. But what we did was we did significant amount of research and we found that over the next 10 years, it's going to get much cheaper. Over the next five years, it's going to be 79% cheaper. And 10 years from now, it's going to be 92% cheaper. Right? Which means that it's going to be not just a consumer curiosity, but an earth-shaking manufacturing revolution. Now, the first and most important one that we talked about was 3D printing. The second one I want to talk to you about is robotics. Now, robotics are the technology that never fails to disappoint. We always thought, at this point in history, either robots would be doing amazing things for us, working for us, or we would all be working for them. One of those two. Right? But the reality is, while we were writing great science fiction about robots, actual robots were becoming much more productive. So the early industrial robots cost millions of dollars. But the next generation of industrial robots started to be much more reasonably priced. They cost around $250,000 when you design and install them. But that's just the beginning. In fact, today, we have the newest generation of robots, what we call intelligent robots, and they cost 90% less than the same robots that were available just three or four years ago. And not only are they much less expensive, you can actually set them up, install them, and have them working in one day, and they can work on the assembly line next to people. They don't need to be caged away in any special environments. So the first generation, we thought of as very sophisticated automation. The second generation, we realized were flexible and could be redesigned and redeployed. But this third generation is truly intelligent. And so all of this effort that we have made to create a global supply chain running around the world looking for low-cost labor, we may not need nearly as much of that in the future. So the first revolution was 3D printing. The second one is intelligent robotics. The third one is open source electronics. Now, we are used to talking about open source software. Right? We actually, every phone that we have, almost every product that we use today, if it's on the web or on a mobile phone or a tablet, it uses open source software. But we've not thought much about open source hardware, but it's coming. And the reason it's coming is because the way that control systems are designed and managed has now been completely transformed by Moore's law. So originally, when you made a control system for a product, we use something called embedded electronics. And if you're not an electronics nerd, electro an embedded chip is basically a hardwired chip. It's not very smart. It's designed to be cheap and simple. Right? If you have a, an embedded chip in your toaster, it knows timing. Right? It doesn't know anything else. But general purpose computers, the kind we have on our desk or in our pocket, those are really smart. And they can be redesigned and reprogrammed very easily. And it's gotten to the point where the room-sized computer of 1978 that fit on your desk in 1989 now fits in your pocket. And for about $10, you can put it on anything. We can put an entire PC on a toothbrush, on a doorknob. We can make every device intelligent. And because these things have been standardized, we can start to write open source software for them and develop multiple platforms. And that's exactly what's happening. Consumers and businesses are starting to create open source hardware platforms. And they're starting to share physical product designs online. 
So just to give you one example, we looked at one website called Thingiverse. It's a website for sharing product designs. Now, four years ago, on average, people were sharing 20 or 30 new designs every month. Today, they're sharing on the order of 30,000 new product designs every single month. This is the kind of exponential curve that we're used to seeing and thinking about when we talk about software or social networking. The only difference is it's all about hardware, right? And that's an, the third revolution. Now, each one of these things is pretty substantial by itself. But the fact is that they actually are working in concert with each other. And what's going on is that we're in an era of transition from one that's defined by hardware constraints to one that's defined by software. So if we take something like making a physical part, today we build a mold or a cast, right? And it takes time. It can take weeks, and they're huge. In the future, you design a part, you print it, right? Today, if we want to have a hardwired production line, it takes weeks or months to set up a manufacturing environment. In the future, if we want to reconfigure our whole assembly line, we can do it online, right? And today, if we spend weeks or months developing a customized embedded chip, in the future, we'll take a standard platform and write a little bit of new software for it. So all of these fundamental rules about how to do things and how to make them uh, that we've learned for a century are going away. And this new environment is something that we call the software-defined supply chain. It's exciting, right? We're exci raise your hand if you're asleep. Nobody ever raises their hand. I, I, oh, someone raised their hand this time. This, you've broken my perfect record. But I'm not sure I believe you. So in this era of the software-defined supply chain, if you are a smart, rational, level-headed business person, and I assume that all of you are, you should be asking a simple question. When on earth is this going to happen? Right? Because Let's face it, when somebody from any kind of technology company gets up on stage and starts talking to you about some incredible, amazing technological revolution that's coming, you should be skeptical. Because if you weren't, we would all, if, if there was reason to believe every technological prediction, we would have all come here on our own jetpacks. Right? But we didn't. So, in addition to the question of when, which we should absolutely be asking, there's a bunch of related questions. Where? If this is true, where should we put our new manufacturing facilities, right? Who, which companies will be most affected, right? And what kind of strategies can we pursue in order to take advantage of these changes? And of course, lastly, at the highest level, why is this really so important? We have spent a year trying to answer those questions, and the results are amazing. Now, if you are a rational, level-headed, reasonable person, Right? The first thing you want to, do is, want to know is, how did we do our research? And we did three things. First of all, we wanted to be very specific. So instead of talking about 3D printing and robotics at, in the aggregate, we decided to take four products that are completely different in cost, in volume, in complexity, and uh, personalization, and look at the, each individual product by itself. So we looked at a hearing aid, a mobile phone, an industrial display, the kind that tells you that your session has been rescheduled, right, or your flight is late, and a washing machine. Okay, so from the small and incredibly personal, all the way up to a large mechanical device. Now, I don't know if anybody will ever need a personalized washing machine, but it might be possible now. So we, we literally bought these, and by the way, I've had the most wonderful conversation of my entire life with IBM procurement, trying to explain why I would like to buy a washing machine so I can destroy it. Eventually, I got the answer. They let us tear down these machines and analyze each part and each piece of assembly. The second thing we did was assemble a global team of experts. And it may shock you to hear this, but not every single one of these experts was inside of IBM. Right? But we got some. So we had the IBM research, of course, we also have a special team in IBM called Plant Location International. And what they do is advise companies on the great places to put factories based on labor cost, tax rates, and infrastructure. So we wanted to make sure that when we thought about the whole supply chain design, we were actually using the most appropriate questions and right data. In addition to that, we got help from an organization called SourceMap. They're a spin out of MIT, right? They focus on identifying products, sourcing, and global supply chains. 
And we got help from an organization in the UK, which is a spin out of the University of Nottingham called Econlist. And they're the world's top experts on not just 3D printing, but actually taking parts, analyzing them, and being able to estimate the cost both now and in the future using 3D printing. And we took all of that data and we gave it to two of the world's top experts in linear programming and supply chain modeling from Northwestern University and Pennsylvania State University. And we said, build us a model, build us a real-time model where we can put all this data in and tell us what is the optimal supply chain, how will we do it? And that's exactly what we did. So we took all of this data, we put it in the model, and we said, tell us what's the right supply chain? Where should we put our products? And will they cost more or less using 3D printing and robotics and open source hardware than they do today? So what I want to do now, we're getting to the exciting part. This is a, as if the first part here wasn't that exciting, this is the real excitement because now we're going to tell you the big results of our study. Okay. The first amazing result is really about cost. Now we hoped, it was our most fervent hope, that the cost of making things with this software-defined supply chain would be cheaper than the cost of making them in a traditional supply chain. And the answer is yes, it is. In fact, the answer is 23% less. So for each and every one of these products, we looked at them over four points. First, we said, what is it today? What is the current cost to make these items? Secondly, we said, what would it be if we made them today using this software-defined supply chain? What would it be in five years and what years time? And the answer is, already today, it's cheaper to make some products like hearing aids using its software-defined supply chain. Five years from now, every single product that we analyze is significantly cheaper to make. And 10 years from now, it's no contest. It absolutely will be cheaper to use these new technologies. But if you go away from this discussion today thinking that it's all about cost, you've missed the point. Because cost is minimum, it's necessary. No one will adopt these technologies if they cost more to make the same product. But scale, scale is the real uh, amazing result. So today, if you need a manufacturing facility, you've got to have a certain level of scale in order to be cost competitive. These new technologies do away with many of the traditional requirements for achieving high volumes and economies of scale to be cost competitive. So much so that they actually are, by 2017, they require about 75% less scale. And by 2022, almost 10 years from now, it's about 90%. So in other words, if you needed to make a million units a year today, you only need 100,000 units in the future. Or in the case of hearing aids, it's 98% less volume. Right? And so the business model that supported one or two companies in the market today might in the future support 10 or 20 or 30 new competitors. So how does this all add up? Right? If you recall when I started the conversation, we were talking about big, complex, and global supply chains. Right? And we worry a lot about things like green uh, footprint. Right? When you open up this box, your phone or your washing machine, it's already got significant frequent flyer miles, right? It's got a significant carbon footprint. We assumed, we believed that 3D printing would, and ro advanced robotics would always be cheaper as, uh, in terms of green, in terms of carbon dioxide footprint because we were replacing inventory and physical facilities with information. That was wrong. Turns out that in some cases, especially in the largest products, you can actually end up consuming more energy in a 3D printed, a robotic assembled world than you do today. Now, do we think it's a showstopper? Absolutely not. But what it does do is it reminds us that we can't assume that just because it seems less wasteful, it necessarily is in every dimension. So let's add all these pieces together, right? What does the world look like in the era of a software-defined supply chain? And it's coming very quickly. We started talking about big, complex, and global. What we believe we're headed towards is something entirely different. Small, simple, and local. And what I want to do is just take very specifically the example of a hearing aid, because it's already the best one, 
in terms of cost and efficiency and show you what happens to the optimal supply chain. So today, it's already a little bit cheaper to make a hearing aid in a digital model. Within 10 years, it's dramatically cheaper, 65%. But the impact of scale means that today, when we talk about the optimal supply chain, it's about one or two locations in a market the size of the US. Within 10 years, though, instead of being national, it goes to regional. And eventually, the optimal supply chain is one that is almost entirely local. So every town and city would have their own manufacturing facility for hearing aids. Now, that's the most extreme example, but the pattern is the same for every single product that we looked at. And that means we're going to have industrial disruption in every single major manufacturing industry. Now, I've talked about the good news, and there's so much opportunity here. But the fact is that most industry leaders are not prepared for this new era. Right? We went out and we talked to 50 of the world's top supply chain executives at the world's leading manufacturing companies. 70% of them said that they were only aware or had no awareness at all about how these new technologies would drive their business. And when we asked them what their plans are for the next 10 years in terms of uh, activity and development, it gets even worse, right? It turns out they're planning on doing more of the same things that we already know are kind of obsolete, more standardization and more modularization. Now, there's a great management philosopher named Dilbert who can explain this result. He said, change is good, you go first. Right? And that's exactly what we see, is a lot of discomfort around change. So as part of our discussion, we prepared some recommendations for industry leaders to think about the world. Right? The, first, the first set of recommendations are for industry leaders, and we're also going to talk about recommendations for public policymakers. One of the starting points is thinking about personalization. So we're not going to end up in an era where everything is standardized anymore. If we don't have any requirement to make something standardized, people will want to have it customized, right? We're also going to have to think about competitive environments, right? Today, we have one or two companies in the industry. In the future, we might, that same business might have 10 or 20. And then lastly, we have to think about how we're investing in supply chains, right? In a business that, requ in a business that requires 90% less scale, how do, we, how do we choose to deploy our capital? Because many of these businesses will be much less capital intensive than they are today. And if you're building a big factory right now with the previous generation of technology, it may never get a great return on investment. So from a capital planning perspective alone, you have to take these new technologies into account. Right? Recommendations, exactly what you would expect. First of all, change how you design and manufacture product or sell it. Secondly, prepare for this new landscape, right? You won't be competing against the same companies. And then lastly, build your supply chain for flexibility. Now, there's, another, there's a similar set of recommendations that apply to policymakers, but they're somewhat different in, in that respect. Uh, for policymakers, they're going to face interesting challenges for example, first and foremost, about competitive advantage. If your country is hoping to build its process of industrialization based on low-cost labor, this strategy might not be viable anymore. The other thing that we're going to see a big challenge in is intellectual property rights. We've never had any success in controlling music and movies online. Right? Once you can define an entire product online, you'll be able to send a new pair of shoes to your friends as easily as you can send a, a new piece of music. And of course, we are so used to defining our tax and operational metrics based on sending physical products. But if we don't have physical products to track, how will we do any of those things? Right? So recommendations for policymakers. First and foremost, new sources of competitive advantage. We believe that will be driven around entrepreneurship. Secondly, New thinking about intellectual property management. And when I say new thinking, I don't mean repeating what's gone on in other industries. And then lastly, let's think about taxing value add instead of physical trade, because we're going to find the physical trade disappears quite quickly. So those are the key conclusions in our recommendations. Now, before we go any further, 
What I want to do is have a thoughtful discussion about this. So it may shock you, but it turns out that consultants don't know everything. And so we've invited up here uh, for a pa quick panel discussion two of the world's top experts in manufacturing and technology. Uh, and I invite them to come up and join me now. Uh, first of all, Dr. Hubertus von Grunberg, the chairman of ABB. Welcome. And uh, secondly, Dr. Leonid Raymond, uh, the chairman of the board of directors of Angstrom. Thank you for joining me today. So shall we take our seats? So I've got some questions prepared for both of you. But before we get started, I'd like to uh, ask you uh, each one at a time to give me your initial reactions. I'd like to start with you, Dr. Von Grunberg. And before I let you say anything, I want to just add my thanks. ABB is one of the world's leading makers of robots. And ABB has been instrumental in helping IBM with some of the analysis. So this would be an excellent time to tell me how we got it all wrong. <laughs> thanks, Paul. Uh, mic on? Is there a switch? I think it's on or no? I think it's on. Let's try it. Um, try it again. There we it's on. Um, thanks, Paul. First of all, I must be a little cautious. I have a huge business protect, to protect. We have uh, $40 billion of annual sales, 150,000 employees, and they sell every day, make and sell every day, product for today's world, a robot for today's uh, assembly, and make automation equipment for today's factories. If I'm too overwhelmingly positive supporting him, I offend many of my customers, and we want to live the day when this and if this finally happens. So with a note of caution, um, first question um, before I get started, if I may, Paul, a question. Why are you so generous and so friendly to me, just to get me to the panel, maybe, to, in your vision, still include um, the need of robots? Vina is around. She may support you. She, you are technical. She is even more so technical. The question is, why would you, if you can 3D print any one part of a washer or any one part of an automobile? The assumption is if we can be competitive on washers, we should be on automobiles because it's different size, different weight, but not fundamentally different. So I was unsuccessful. Why would you assume there's still place for a robot? And why would you not print, 3D print, all the pieces in right sequence coming from the printer already in place? and take out the robot industry altogether. Why are you so nice to us? Why don't we disappear in your vision? Why is there still assembly? Well, I have to say, this is the most unexpected thing. I've never been on a panel posing the question and get one back. But I, I, I think there is actually an answer for that. So uh, robotics, uh, when we analyze these parts, first of all, I should say, I was not successful in convincing IBM procurement to buy me a car. That's a, one of the first issues. Uh, but the secondly, though, what we realize is when you 3D print and manufacture products, uh, they still have to be assembled. And we were very careful to evaluate the limits of some of these technologies. So parts are individually printed, but they still require assembly. And so when we did our model, we knew that if, if there was no robotic assembly, it would not be quite as transformational. So we looked at that very carefully, and we came to the conclusion that uh, there was no way to go forward without a significant element of robotic assembly. OK, so he wanted some uh, remarks, some initial remarks uh, from me about uh, this entire situation. Uh, ABB is very broad-based, but the issue in question today is the robotics area of um, ABB. Paul got some input from ABB. We have been responsive. We appreciate the cooperation. There's a lot of learning for us. This keeps us on our toes. Will we, we will be ready by the time the market is, I promise to you. We are always looking out. We will not be the last to make these changes. Um, give you one example. In the past, when you wanted to robotize an assembly line, to uh, take labor out. And taking labor out means raising standard of living. We are being good to people by replacing low paid jobs, making people free for re-education and qualifying for higher paid jobs. We mean it in a positive sense, taking labor out from an assembly line. You had to wait 
for a new assembly, a new product generation to come because robotizing an existing double-belted typical automotive or so assembly line was hard to do from a hardware point of view. You had, or for uh, mobile devices, you had to wait for the next product generation and to design a new totally robotized assembly line for that product from the outset. You could not simply take from the existing product and its manufacturing process the labor off and the robot in because the robot was dangerous. It had to be kept in cages like a wild animal. A tiger is being kept in, in cages because it can hurt humans. A robot can hurt humans. The new robots are without cages. They are small, they are light, they are fast. Um, the plastics, in spite, of the, in spite of the metal, may make the engineers with you wonder how can the precision of final location be achieved with the flexibility of plastics? Well, smartness. We sense position and we have the motor calibrating the vibrations of the softer and lighter plastics. These light two-armed robots with vision and tactile come without cage, are not dangerous to humans. They have sensors when approaching a human. They have redundant proximity sensation, not to get too close to you, not to never hurt you. And they are being put in place of an existing manual labor job. This new generation is um, on the verge of coming to market. So a lot is going on in our industry on our side as well. We are a little farther from your vision. Uh, I have different customers with my hardware than IBM has with their software. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grunberg. And by the way, uh, your question about when is, is very relevant. And one of the things that we are going to do is we're not just going to talk about this model we created. We are going to release the entire model as an open source application and all of the data. So your folks and anybody who wants to will be able to download this model, do their own analysis, change the assumptions, and see how it looks. So thank you for your comments. Before uh, I pose any specific questions, let me turn to you, Dr. Raymond. You're the chairman of the board of directors for Angstrom. You're obviously uh, extremely knowledgeable about communications and advanced technology here in Russia and globally. And I would love to get your reactions. Uh, Thank you very much. Well, since our panel was postponed three times, so I'm sure that here in the room we have people who are really interested in this subject. So the rule, Mr. Brody, about raising your hands if you're asleep, this doesn't work anymore. So, yes, I do represent a slightly different company and um, we're working on microchips, microelectronics. So I was very interested and it was um, very exciting to listen to Mr. Brody's presentation and uh, the processes that you described in your report and in IBM's report, they mostly has to do with microelectronics. So quite recently we saw accelerating growth of different micro schemes, such as PPPM, for example. I mean, reprogramming some matrices so we can change different settings, something that Mr. Brody was mentioning in his presentation. And this technology is being used in toasters and in washing machines everywhere. So based on 2012 results, PolyLife company has issued a report after they have analyzed the situation. So they said that it is now nine times more chips being used than new ones. Well, this is just uh, once again stresses the fact that today we're facing the third industrial revolution. And The Economist quite recently published an interesting article and the cover page said that we are now facing the third industrial revolution. And this is true because today people are actually ready 
to pay more for quicker entrance to the market, for more flexible approaches, and uh, sometimes equipment may be different or microchips may be popular and some are less popular. So this is just a confirmation of the conclusions that we voiced. And uh, your presentation was very interesting, Mr. Brody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, let me ask uh, your one, uh, one follow-up question to you, if I might. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, the, use, the widening use of microelectronics and making even the smallest products very intelligent. Uh, how do you think that will present new opportunities for small and medium-sized fast-growth companies in Russia? Well, it seems to me that presently micro schemes with open code are more expensive. Well, from the standpoint of use and uh, consumers, I mean, uh, they're energy consuming and perhaps not that fast. As compared to other micro schemes with special features or functions and uh, programmed for different devices or equipment. However, they are more attractive, as I was saying, because, because if you want to for example, use microchip, I said, then you have to design it, and sometimes it takes more than a year, and you have to change your production line or build a new one to produce this particular chip or microchip. So during this period, the product that will embed this chip falls out of the market because market keeps developing. So what we have today is preferable. In our country, we have a lot of creative people, very creative, and they like innovations, and they develop new microchips and micro schemes. But I don't think we have a well-developed microelectronics production lines well except for some except for some exceptions but we can actually use these chips for a lot of types of equipment and uh, hopefully in the future we can improve the situation and small companies might come up with some very interesting solutions and uh, perhaps the end product will be in demand perhaps not only in Russia, but globally. Yes, I agree. I hope that the products will be globally and it will create opportunity for new companies in Russia. Now, uh, Dr. von Grunberg, let me ask you one question. You mentioned at the beginning of your talk that ABB is a large and diversified company. And of course, robotics is one part of the total picture at ABB. How do you think about using these elements, both robotics and 3D printing, in other parts of ABB's business to stay competitive? This, of course, this opens, uh, if it also happens, and fast enough, this opens a uh, totally new business. I would like to remind you just of one. With the flexibility of individual one-piece manufacture, there comes a whole new meaning to simulation, to computer simulation models, because while you were making a million identical cars, washers, you could have recourse to the classical prototyping and testing after some superficial simulation, which didn't have to be totally accurate. You could build the 10 prototypes and test them in the lab, physically test in the lab, because you knew if those 10 specified exactly to the detail by drawing and specification list were perfect, that the next 1,000 would most likely also be because they were identical by design. Now you want to be able, with this technology, to make one of its kind. This one of its kind may have a behavior different from its sister that it is a derivative of, that it is being changed from in order to accommodate a special demanding customer who wants it different. 
with any change if the product is a safety product in particular and if you have uh, product liability countries like the USA where you better not fail and better not disappoint, it, disappoint a customer, you must be sure that this one time made change pleases the customer and doesn't fail. And uh, you cannot prototype it uh, with the 3D printer and test it in a physical lab first, then the entire economy is gone, then it's down the tube. It needs to be validated by software. That's, I mean, alongside, ladies and gentlemen, alongside this, what Paul has demonstrated, comes a whole new industry to make this viable. This is the tip of the iceberg, and what is under the water is just humongous. This is a different world. Talking about that, if I may add one thought following this one. Um, in Russia, you spoke about new entrepreneurial possibilities for small size companies in Russia based on this model. In Russia, you may consider it to be a fortune, an advantage, not to have the majority of your uh, economy based on high volume, on mass manufacturing of all sorts of you are a big automobile manufacturer, yes, and you have white goods and you have, but I would say China makes some more without being any way critical. Germany for its small size, we are a small country, Russia is a big country, we make some more. In this world, you would not at all be unhappy about that fact. You might think about going with your brilliant software capability in this country to leapfrog for Germany, France, Italy are strong with, and to go into this generation of product manufacture right away, eliminating the humongous, endless auto factories, jumping over them, saying this is a useless step, this comes after. We do some other intelligence business, intelligent business in between, and when it comes to the new world, this world that you have seen from Paul, the Germans and the Americans will undergo and the Chinese, endless write-offs, humongous, devastating write-offs. We won't, because we are embarking now on the generation after. Is that a thought, Paul? Uh, I, not only is it a thought, but I need to come with you. You need to come with us on tour to spread this message, because you have really thought about this in, in an amazing way. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. This, when we sat down and really thought about all the implications, you're, you are exactly right. We, we are in complete agreement. It's not just a physical capability. We will have to simulate everything, and it will change the, the process of designing products, but it will also change even the process of selling them. Right? You won't just pick an SK. You will have some role in designing your own products. So we think it, the world is truly going to change. Now, in a moment, I'm going to open it up for questions for the audience. But before I do that, and give, to give you some time to think about uh, uh, brilliant and challenging questions for Dr. Grunbunberg and for Dr. Riemann, I want to ask Dr. Riemann about communications. So at IBM, we talk a lot about making a smarter planet, and we think a lot about how this open source electronic environment, it won't just improve the ease of customization and development, it's going to start making products truly exceptionally smart. When you can put the equivalent of an entire PC on a doorknob or a toothbrush, it's going to make the product smart. And these smart products are going to be network connected. What do you think about as the big impacts of billions and billions of products on national communications infrastructure and things like that? Uh, Before answering, I wanted to just make a comment to what uh, Mr. Grunberg said, because he touched upon a very interesting topic. I believe that he's absolutely right. If we take Russia, uh, the development of these new approaches uh, the development of these three key main principles that Mr. Brody was referring to, well, it's very important. 3D printing is one of them. 3D technologies are very important for Russia. It was not long ago that I attended uh, a forum in, in Moscow, and uh, somebody quoted the fact, uh, microchipped well, uh, produced according to uh, the 3D technologies, 65 nanometers is uh, similar to a microchip that was produced according to the 32 nanometers uh, technologies without applying 3D technologies. And this is a very interesting fact. 
I want to draw your attention to this because this means that if we take production lines, well, I don't know how to put it, but if we take production lines that are not as uh, well sophisticated because we know that 32, 32 nanometers is much more expensive than the 65 nanometer production line. So if we take these uh, more simpler, less sophisticated uh, well production lines, we can use innovative approaches to produce microchips uh, that will not be worse in any way than the most modern uh, chips and we can use them we can use them in devices that are produced at the small and medium sized enterprises SMEs what my colleague from Germany has said and um, well it, this is a very interesting topic and uh, well I believe that we should remind ourselves of the cloud technologies that is a very interesting thing I believe that what we're talking about here should be part and parcel of the cloud technologies but today uh, we are always interacting with each other. It's very hard to imagine a person without a mobile device, without a cell phone, people who would not respond to their cell phone ringing and so on. And within the cell phone, there is a, a GPS system, for example. His or her friends should know or may know where he or she is. Enemies can know too, unfortunately. But. Uh, while talking about privacy, of course, there are some problems here that we have to resolve. But on the other hand, this opens up new opportunities for man. And we can save time. We can optimize our everyday schedule. I was going by the uh, information stand of Sberbank here. And they are displaying their software they, that they install on, their, on the telephones. And you can open this application the software and you see the entire infrastructure of Sberbank around yourself. You see where where the outlets are, where the points of sale are, where the subsidiaries are, you see how they work, you see their schedule and so on. Which ones are closed right now, not because they are closed, not because it's a day off, but, but because something went wrong and they close it down for a couple of hours. At this ATM they have enough money. At this one, well you should not go to that one because it doesn't have enough money. So this is reality that is uh, getting the latest information. So everything around you, cell phones, washing machines, the Volvo car, well, that tells you how much gas it has. And uh, well, the toothbrush, toothbrush that actually tells you, please throw me away, you need to buy a new one. Well, this is, this is a very interesting thing. And while well, reality becomes not, not virtual, but more real and more, more contemporary. Thank and, you. And you, you've exactly described what I think is the dream of every electronics company, to have a product that sells its replacement, right? So, so yeah, throw me out, I need a, you need a new one of me, right? So this is the dream of all of my clients, to have the products that literally sell themselves. So with that, I would like to put the floor open to questions, and I have a colleague who's got a microphone, if there's any questions. And please, all the, all the nasty ones and uh, difficult ones to Paul, I'm a little shy and timid. Okay. And I've had special media training on how not to answer difficult questions. <laughs> I have a short question. You were showing how production will become more efficient on one of your well slides on the display. Well, the hearing aids, hearing aids, and telephones. There, there were there were different. Uh, Different data there. Well, one one is uh, well bad for. Did, well, did you did you get my question or not? Yes. So, so we wanted to be very specific, and we knew when we set about in this analysis that some things would be ready for three D printing and robotic assembly sooner than others, and that's why we did pick specific products. So the hearing aid is first on the list, but by the end of the time span that we looked at, every single product, even a washing machine was cheaper and more efficient to produce in this new environment. Does that answer your question? No. Okay, we didn't do it right. Can I try to add? Please. I add something to what Boris was asking about, but this is my personal point of view, if you forgive me for this. I believe that the more innovational a device is, the less this percentage share will change. 
if you understand what I'm saying, because uh, telephone is an innovational device. It's not only about the modern technology, but modern design, modern assembly principles, and so on. And uh, well, that's how I would answer. But but a hearing aid is a simple thing. And it's un not sophisticated, and you can innovate without end. But uh, well, if you if you take if you take a spade that is unsophisticated unsophisticated at all, you should you should use digital a digital approach more than for a more more sophisticated device. Is that right? Well, I don't know. Maybe Mr. Ryman says. Well, the, uh, one of our observations is that. Um, uh, products that change very, very quickly. Uh, if it's very dependent on cutting edge technology, it might be harder to do things like simulate. But we also expect that products that have value driven by personalization will be the fastest. Because a hearing aid that's made just exactly for your ear is much more valuable than one that isn't. Um, now, obviously, it's the same thing for things like shoes or other things. Now, I have to admit, I, I don't know how I want a washing machine personalized, but I'm also confident that somebody will figure out a way to make a personalized washing machine and charge more for it. So do we have other questions from the audience? OK, if not, then what I would like to do is bring our discussion to a close. Before I do that, I just want to tell you that what we gave you today, if it's on your chair, is a copy of our executive summary. We're going to have a full report with all the data in this, and you will be able to download the entire electronic supply chain model and play with it yourselves when we publish it in July. You can do that by visiting our website or leave us one of your business cards, and we will send it uh, to you at the time of publication. Uh, or you can grab one of my cards.